Hare Krishna. So thank you very much for joining today for this discussion on the Bhagavad Gita. Today is one of the most, I feel, one of the most important and yet one of the least uh, understood or applied verses from the Gita with respect to how we conduct ourselves and how we conduct in relationship with others. So, I feel in our practical conduct of our devotional life, in our relationship with others, uh, applying this verse actually can be a game changer. So, the topic we are discussing today is speak to give peace of mind, not a piece of your mind. This is based on Bhagavad Gita, 17th chapter, 15th verse. So, Anudvega Karam Vakyam Satyam Priyahitam Chayat Swadhyaya Bhyasanam Chayva Vanmayam Tapa Uchate. So, Krishna is speaking over here. Anudvega Karam Vakyam Vakya. What kind of words you speak? Anudvega Karam, that which doesn't agitate people. Satyam, speak the words that are truthful. Priya hitam, priya is those which are pleasing. And hitam is those which are beneficial. Chayat. Swadhyaya bhyasanam chaiva. And those which repeat scripture, which basically recitation of scripture itself is vanmayam tapa uchyate. It is austerity of speech or discipline of speech. So I'll discuss broadly four points today. Firstly, we will understand the power of speech. Then we will talk about how to regulate and use the power of speech. Then how and why we may self-righteously misuse that power. And then lastly, how we can speak purposefully and effectively. So let's begin. Understand the power of speech. So what words can do? Words can have both they can be constructive, they can be destructive, power of speech. Constructive speech, it can be encouraging, it can comprise of encouraging appreciative words that can motivate and empower people. On the other hand, destructive power of speech becomes destructive when we speak harsh critical words which can demoralize and devastate people. So we can say these are two broad extremes. And let's look at each of these a little bit more. So when you talk about the power of speech being constructive, what does that mean? People, so it's been observed that if some people, somebody is committing, contemplating suicide, you know, if they, they can, their life can be saved by just a few encouraging words. So, Speech can not just be constructive, it can be literally life-saving, not just uh, metaphorically or rhetorically life-saving, it can even be literally life-saving. And somebody is about to say jump off a bridge or something like that and they hear some kind words. So we should never underestimate the power of a kind word. That is what speech can do on the positive side. And on the negative side, speech can devastate the words can hurt more than swords because swords inflict wounds that are usually visible and they are often curable. But the wounds that words inflict are invisible. The wounds, the words, words break hearts. It's not so easily visible. And the incurable because when faith is shattered, the Bhagavatam says it's like a broken pot. We can fix it but the fixed pot is never as strong. It is never becomes the original pot. So, speech can, can damage, even devastate. So, words shape words. Uh, that's why we need to all watch our words. Chanakya Pandit says that one who wishes to rule the world needs expertise of tongue more than expertise of sword. Normally, warriors, at least uh, in the pre-20th 20, 20, century, 21st century, yeah, pre-20th century, the heads of state would also be fighting wars. 
not just commanding those who are fighting wars so <clears throat> they needed to be expert in swords however their personal expertise alone is not enough they need to motivate their soldiers and that motivation of soldiers happens by their expertise of tongue when they speak in a way that is motivating inspiring and thrilling then they can rule the world now again ruling the world is not always desirable because who is ruling it matters hitler was one of the is considered to be one of the most powerful orators of the last century and his oratory skills caused devastation they eventually caused the death of millions of people so on the other hand there are other leaders who were who were inspiring in a positive way and their words had a positive effect so the point is that words shape worlds now how they shape it constructively or destructively depends on how we use those words that's the first point that words are extremely powerful and now we talk about how we all need to regulate this power at the second part i'll discuss so we are all in a sense like unlicensed gun carriers in america especially there is a debate always going on that you know how much should guns be allowed legally some people say that uh, it's our right and uh, i have had a gun for five decades i have never used it wrongfully but if a thief comes and tries to rob me or threaten my family if police don't come on time what do i do i need a gun it's my right and others say that no but that's how people get guns uh, who people criminals get guns when guns are freely available and then they misuse it so those who are pro gun lobby they say no but criminals will anyway get guns the only people who will have guns will be criminals and we will be in trouble so the argument goes on so the solution they say is that have more background checks and give like guns to regular lesser people to fewer people but after greater scrutiny so and uh, but irrespective of whether we have a uh, we have a physical gun or not we are all actually unlicensed gun carriers why unlicensed because you know this loaded gun that is constantly within us it's our own tongue and we don't need a license to have a tongue everybody has a tongue and why is it like a gun it's not just a gun it's a loaded gun and it's not just uh, sometimes it's not just at our home in a corner kept in a closet it's constantly with us because it's within us and why we do we compare it to a tongue uh, to a gun because you know, the tongue has no bones but it can break uh, break things it can break other people's hearts and it can break our own bones if people get angry with us they may break our bones so a tongue the tongue is like a loaded or rather we have a loaded gun in the form of our tongue so we need to be extremely cautious about the way we speak and especially if somebody is articulate in speaking then they actually need to be even more careful that means they have the capacity to formulate words in a in a very effective way now what that effect will be will it be constructive or destructive that varies uh, that may vary mm. <clears throat> so i am often prone to this cuz i articulate my words very carefully so sometimes if i get angry with someone then i can i can condemn in very harsh sarcastic or unforgettable ways unforgettable not in a positive but in a negative way so this talk of course every time we speak about krishna it is for our own purification as well as for other edification but i would say this talk is especially as much for me as much it is for all of you so so un- we are all like unlicensed gun carriers so with this background let's look at what the bhagavad gita's verse is saying so the four components which krishna says we can classify them broadly into two two broad categories so krishna says anudvega karam that is non agitating don't agitate others satyam that's truth, truthful priyam that is pleasing and hitam is beneficial 
these are four components of disciplined speech vanmayam tapa uchyate so it's interesting the concept of austerity of speech the austerity of speech i have translated it here as or rendered it here as discipline of speech by specifically austerity or discipline see austerity means that there is something which we can do but we voluntarily choose not to do say for example austerity in eating say it's fasting that means we have we have food to eat if somebody is starving because they don't have food then they're not really fasting that's not really called fasting that's fasting but it's more of starving so fasting as austerity means i have food and i may even have the right to eat food but still i choose voluntarily not to eat food why for some higher purpose so similarly uh, so when we talk about disciplining our speech we have the power to speak and we may even have the right to speak but still we carefully regulate our speak speech speaking so it's disciplining our speaking just as we may as we may perform austerity uh, of the body now in that case we are regulating when we are is a fasting we are regulating what goes inside our mouth so when we are vanmayam tapa uchyate when we are un, there is vanmaya tapa and there is annamaya tapa annamaya tapa is we regulate what goes inside the mouth and then uh, vanmaya tapa is we regulate what comes out of the mouth and in both you know eating whatever we like there is some pleasure but we carefully regulate what are right that's uh, whatever we eat that serves a higher purpose so similarly we may speak anything many things and that there might be some pleasure in that but we regulate our speech for a higher purpose so that is one my tapa austerity of speech so in austerity of speech there are two aspects there is being sensitive and being sensible so being sensitive means we consider people's feelings we consider the emotional impact of what we are doing we consider the emotional context now is this going to on the negative side at the very least or at the not the negative side at the very least what we speak shouldn't agitate others so that is the theme of our talk speak to give peace of mind that means don't agitate at the very least don't agitate and we could say at the best don't just don't don't just agitate is like a, a low standard it's like we are setting the bar of expectation very low at least don't do this at least do this much but then on the positive side speak in a way that is pleasing that people feel after hearing they feel uplifted they feel they feel happy so that is the sensitive aspect the that's the we could say more the emotional side of the speak speaking and then there's the rational side we could say the sense what we have to speak has to also be sensible and that is truthful satya and hita so when we speak something sensible we what we speak is truthful and then not just truthful but it's also there are hundreds of things that may be truthful but are all truths beneficial for people to hear we speak that truth which is beneficial so <clears throat> what is the difference between truthful and beneficial you know for example a student starts studying math and maybe maybe they just first year second year and then if it's a little difficult yeah it seems difficult but you study you practice you know, it won't be that difficult it will be easy so imagine the students is students is speaking one first studying first year math and it is difficult and the student shows and the teacher shows you think this is difficult you come to college and you will have to study this 500 page book well that's truthful the student has to study that but is that beneficial at that time no so when we talk about sensible speech truthful we could say is the lower bar and that part of truth which benefits others that is that is a higher bar so sensible so that's how sensitive and sensible speaking so let's look at this further when speech is effective it is sensitive and sensible so now we could look at extremes if something is sensitive but not sensible so i'll take a medical metaphor throughout this class but to illustrate this power of speaking so sometimes pain has to be caused and sometimes if pain is avoided that may end up causing greater pain so if the, if a doctor doesn't give injection to avoid hurting the child then what is happening the doctor is doing this service so we are being sensitive but not sensible if somebody is 
doing something wrong mm, then that is going to create trouble for them in the future then we have to address that so when we are what is happening we are caring for their feelings or i don't want to hurt them i don't want to hurt their feelings but we are going to actually let them go on a path that will hurt them in the future so if we care only for others feelings and not their future that is one extreme that is unhealthy the other extreme is where we are sensible but not sensitive so the doctor doesn't care to anesthetize before operating so when if that's like that then what happens a doc- such a doctor would be actually culpable <clears throat> in medical science the discovery of anesthesia chloroform and other thing that's considered one of the biggest breakthroughs because prior to that surgery had to be done without uh, anesthesia it's excruciating so now if somebody has the facility uh, to min decrease the pain during a surgery and they don't do that that that's horrible so the doctor may say i am curing the pa- i am saving the patient's life well but you are making their life miserable right now you making their hell life hell right now and if you can avoid it why not so if you are sensible without being sensitive then we say i am concerned about your future but okay don't be so concerned about the future me that i sense no concern for the present me you know there is a present me and there is a potential me and we need to feel when we communicate others need to feel concern for both so that's where the question of balance comes in so now uh, knowing what is the balance is not so easy but what is easy is to know what are the extremes and then we can avoid the extreme then we can say somewhere in between the two the balance would be there so in general uh, if we are driving on a road if there are road markers then we can know okay i am in my lane or i am going out of my lane so whether we are on our lane may not be so easy to know but if there, there are ro- there are uh, road markers or ro- some kind of road bumps then as soon as we go on the extremes go on those road bumps hey, we start let's start some kind of jarring sound comes up we start jolting and bumping oh i have gone off now so what happens like that we can know the extremes and then by that we can infer the balance so what are the extremes speaking the truth without compassion that is hard hearted and having compassion without truth that is empty headed so both these are extremes speaking the truth means in the previous context caring for people's future compassion means caring for people's feelings so both are required if the both are not there then we are most likely to be ineffective so let's look at this from a quadrant perspective the content of speech and the consequence of speech so either we speak truth or not truth that's on the x axis and the y axis is whether we have compassion and whether we don't have compassion now by compassion i'm not talking about a philosophical conception of con- compassion that people are in bodily conception and we are giving them uh, the knowledge of spiritual life i'm talking about compassion in terms of here in terms of sensitivity to people's emotions uh, being aware that people are hurting and ensuring that we hurt them the least so the best is when the speech is kind hearted and level headed then it is most likely to be effective so there is truth and there is compassion both now <clears throat> if there is only truth but no compassion then that is we may be logically correct but we won't be psychologically correct that means we our, uh, our effect will not our speech will not have the desired effect now on the other hand if there is neither truth nor compassion then it will be it can be worthless or it may even be destructive like when we gossip or when we do rumor mongering that is unhealthy speech and then i would say the last left bottom is the most unhealthy if we are compassionate but without being truthful then that's empty headed and nowadays political correctness can go towards extremes where we are so sensitive that we don't even ever speak the truth so let's look at these one by one so right uh, let's start with extreme political correctness so now it now political correctness is not always bad sometimes certain words do convey unnecessary negative connotations and they need to be avoided so 
uh, that is fine but <clears throat> sometimes the political correctness can go to extremes so when there is moral posturing about being sensitive at the cost of being sensible that is where the political correctness becomes extreme so now biologically speaking there are two genders but now gender theory suggests that actually gender is a social construct not a biological fact and there are different gender theorists who say there are 12 genders there are seven genders there are 63 genders and every gender has its own pronoun and they insist that if you don't address me by the pronoun of my gender then that is you are being offensive to me in fact in some countries like canada is made into a law that it is a culpable offense if you don't address people by the gender of their preference now <clears throat> yes we don't want to offend we don't want to offend people but you no know, when people posture morally it's moral posturing you just see how sensitive i am but actually that sensitivity is at the expense of being sensible so yes people have their individuality and people have their challenges because of their particular gender orientation problem gender dysphoria or whatever and we don't want to impose but when reality is rejected in the name of political correctness then are we actually helping people or are we actually hurting people so <clears throat> there is a big debate in the western world now about especially in europe and america about transgender women so men 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 when men become women by trans by changing their gender are they actually women or are they men so they say no they are women because that's what they believe they are but then this what has happened in many competitions female competitions if the transgender men transgenders men who became women they participate they easily win and women may uh, practice for years for athletics or sports and then the men who become women so easily win and then so there is is there some differentiation to be made no they are women in all times well is that really right so this is of course a volatile issue politically in today's world but the point is that sometimes political correctness can go to extremes so then there can be also logical correctness that can go to extremes so we need to know that when we are communicating communicating with people people need to be inspired not just instructed this is right and this is wrong well many people are there to tell what is right and what is wrong but people need to be inspired to do the right thing and quite often when when we are communicating with people they need to know how much we care before they care how much we know you may think i am making a complete airtight rational case this is what should be done okay and people will go and do what they want to do why because their heart has not been touched so we we are not just creatures of logic when we function in real life logic is one factor we consider while deciding but it is not the only factor that's why simply speaking the truth without compassion doesn't work now if there is no truth neither neither truth nor compassion then this is a especially destructive a form of speaking if we consider gossiping now in gossiping what happens first of all when do we gossip or how do we define gossiping one simple way would be when we hear something we like about someone we don't like when we hear something we like about someone we don't like that is the time when it's very easy to start gossip oh really you know i, I always knew this person was terrible but i just didn't know the facts now i know i'm going to broadcast it to the whole world we get a perverse joy in that now another way to know when we are gossiping is in sanskrit the word is prajalpa so unnecessary or damaging speech so when we speak something negative about someone to those who don't who can't do anything about it it's not relevant for them you know this what happened in this country or this this what this politician did or sometimes even within our movement it's a big movement and this happened over here and that happened over there so the poking our nose into others business is bad enough but when we gossip what is happening we are poking others nose 
into what is not their business so we are actually forcible forcing people to get agitated over things that are not relevant for them yes there are so many things that may go wrong in so many parts of the world and sometimes it can happen within our movement also now we have to see why have we come here we have come here to move toward krishna so if we have the resources to keep moving toward krishna we have the information we have the inspiration we have we have the experience also that we are moving toward krishna then why do we need to worry uh, about what is happening where we don't this doesn't mean that we stay ignorant but but what i'm saying is that we don't see it as a sacred duty to spe- to spread bad vibes everywhere so <clears throat> in the bhagavatam it is vidura doesn't ruddhava doesn't tell vidura that krishna has departed from the world uh, why is that is the mood the underlying mood over there is that no bad news will spread of its own accord why be a sharer of bad news now, that is not necessarily a universal principle sometimes we may have to speak the bad news if especially if in a position of responsibility or especially if the other person needs to know that's okay but here we are talking here we are talking about when it's unnecessary or irrelevant so this is un- this is a, this is counterproductive so then what is effective speech so, so we need to speak to open people's eyes and hearts not shut their mouths and minds speak to open people's eyes and hearts not shut their mouths and minds let's see what this means so sorry yeah what do you mean open people's eyes it means telling if you tell them go this way don't go this way instead give them the eyes to see help them understand that this way is going to go over here this way is going to take you over there now which way do you want to go so opening people's eyes means helping them see things differently not just telling them to act differently so opening people's hearts means instead of pressuring people instead of getting people to do things our way we gain a place in their heart yeah this person is my well wisher this person is wise and that's why i'll do what they say so c- closing or shutting people's mouth what that means is we while refuting people we insult them we refute sometimes people are speaking wrong things and we refute their arguments but while refuting them we speak in such a insulting way that the result is the battle is won but the war is lost we may they may not speak anything more but in their heart, but inside we have lost them they will never come back because people if they feel insulted they get alienated especially in today's world where spirituality is just one option nobody very few people feel that spirituality is a obligation or a something essential in their life so first of all spirituality is option and secondly within spirituality there are so many options so why should people come at all to us if they feel insulted by us and then closing people's minds what does that mean that means we make such unacceptable arguments that they decide that we are not even worth arguing with we make such absurd now our arguments mean we may say who decides my argument is unacceptable well we have to see from people's perspective if they are at a particular level where our argument is not going to make sense to them then we have to be aware of that so then sometimes we also sometimes we ask some question to someone and they give such an answer we realize i'm never going to ask a question to this person again and that's what we feel so we just it shuts our minds so we have to see effective speech means at least we are aware of what effect our speech is having and then we moderate or modify our speech in such a way that we that it starts having the desired effect so this is the second part i discussed regulating the power of speech then the third part is why we may self righteously misuse that power hmm? <clears throat> so let's look at this so we might give justification for speaking strongly and what is that As often we make quote from shastra that a sadhu's words are like surgeon scalpels they may cause pain but they are necessary to cut people's illusions and there are many references from scripture about how say vidura's words cut through the trashtra's illusion as described in the first canto of the shrimad bhagavatam or the sages angira 
and Parvat Muni is there is words cut through the illusions of, Chit- of Chitraketu Maharaj, King Chitraketu. So there are examples of strong speaking, cutting through people's illusions. So you may say, yes, I'm going to speak strongly. Okay. Yes. Let's, let's look at this metaphor itself now further. Yes. We acknowledge that the sadhu's words are like surgeon's scalpels. But, you know, what all goes on before surgery? You know, sir, before surgery, first of all, consent has to be given. The surgery is not something which you can, somebody just visits a hospital and the doctor just drags the person to operating theater and cut, 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 starts cutting them up. No, consent is required before surgery. Then usually before surgery is done, non-surgical treatment is given. Will that work? Will this work? Will this work? And if non-surgical treatments don't work, only then surgical treatment is sought. Then before surgery is done, anesthesia is given. It's vital. And it's so vital that there's a special field of medicine and there are specialist doctors who are present to make sure that anesthesia is administered properly. And then, of course, after surgery, pain medication is given so that the effect of the the painful effect of having cut the body is minimized. So what does all this mean in terms of the metaphor? It's clear that surgery is not something which is to be done casually. So similarly, when we are going to speak strongly, there are certain conditions that need to be met. What is the first thing? Have we got consent? Now, what does consent mean? So in most cases, people have not given consent for us to speak strongly to them. They may not even know or accept. Firstly, they may not even know that except that they're wrong. That means that, that they are sick and they are in need of correction. So first is to acknowledge I'm sick. Second is to acknowledge that I'm sick enough to, uh, do, uh, to have to do surgery. And then so people don't even know that they are wrong or in need of correction. And leave alone except us as authorities hmm, by whom they are ready to be corrected. So when we are speaking strongly, do we have that surgeon-patient relationship with them? And now here, I'm already presuming that we are competent surgeons. Even then, all these things are required. And in most cases, we may not be competent surgeons. We might just be a part, one part of the medical team. But let's, for this point, assume we are competent surgeons. Still, that doesn't give us a license to do surgery freely. We have, we need the consent. So when people come to us, uh, or when most often it's not, uh, it's the, people come to us or we go to them, at that time, it's not so easy. For, it, we are not really justified in speaking strongly. Then have we tried non-surgical treatment? Now, what does that mean? Now, non-surgical treatment means, you now when people are to be corrected, there has to be a, more positive way to correct. Now, when, okay, somebody is speaking something wrong, but then at least come to a program. So we can, we can, there are four A's by which we can try to uh, do non-surgical correction, non-surgical treatment. First is, even if somebody is speaking something wrong, say they are speaking about, about quoting some spiritual teacher whose ideas are completely wrong, hmm? but at least appreciate that their desire to know. How many people in today's world are even interested in spirituality? So appreciate the fact that they have a desire to know. Then even instead of just saying that's stupid. No, yeah, okay. And that's, yeah, that's a possible understanding. And I can understand why, where you are coming from. So appreciate what is right in their point. Even if it be tiny. Mm-hmm. Just because something is a misunderstanding, still it may be a mis it may be understandable misunderstanding, you know. So instead of simply, eh, that's a stupid understanding. That's that's stupid. You know, okay, yeah, I know, I, I understand where you're coming from. Except, so what is right in their point, even if we're tiny, then acknowledge the validity of their concern. When somebody is asking a question, their specific way of expressing the concern, the specific point may not be right. But okay, is this the correct understanding? The fact that you want to know what is the correct understanding, that is important. That's, that's acknowledge the validity of their concern and address that concern through your explanation. Sometimes there are, there are the words which people are speaking 
and underlying it there are there that is their concern so if we hear not just their words but hear their concern and address that concern then sometimes even without confrontation we can help people to rise to a higher understanding we don't have to we don't have to counter or crush counter them or crush their arguments we just help them rise to a higher understanding so if somebody says god is impersonal yes yeah it's a com- it's understandable that people think that god is impersonal impersonal and that's true god is impersonal and he is personal and the bhagavad gita states that god's impersonal aspect rests on his personal aspect and therefore the personal is considered to be the highest or the most complete revelation of the absolute truth so that's one way of approaching you think god is impersonal this is you are mayavadi and mayavadis are meant to go to hell you'll go to hell now stop speaking like this well, that is not going to be at all uh, effective so try non surgical intervention and then what does anesthesia and pain, pain medication mean in this context it means we need a warm relationship where there is trust and appreciation to soften our strong words if that relationship is not there so what is the anesthesia it is the relationship if without the relationship then the strong words come off like very like a sudden surgery without any preparation and then also pain medication is often the doctor or surgeon might go away but there are others who regularly administer pain medication so there has to be a competent empathic support team who can minimize the pain of our strong words otherwise we just do our cutting business and go away uh, that's not at all healthy now we may often speak about say if we are sharing krishna bhakti we may be proud how many people we brought to krishna but who knows how many people we send away from krishna because of our because of our uh, incompetent or inappropriate surgical use of words so this is how we may self we may can we mute everyone else please okay so now we come to the last part of the talk so i talked about why we may self righteously misuse that power now last part will be how to speak purposefully and effectively so now early, now somebody will say no but our scriptures are filled with the strong speaking yes so i'll now qualify that and how i'll show i'll try to show that how all that strong speaking was effective and it was effective at a particular time so just the mode of speaking is not as important as the effect of the speaking so let's take a test case this is a classic example of vidura speaking to dhritarashtra so vidura vidura's illusions were sorry dhritarashtra's illusions were cut apart by vidura's words and vidura became renounced and he left the palace to go to the forest and attain spiritual elevation thereby through severe meditation so we could say this is strong words great success well okay let's look at something now what exactly happened one is the straight forward explanation vidura's strong words cut dhritarashtra's illusion that's that's one explanation but other is so that vidura's strong words only worked because he had invested in a strong relationship and had been enormously patient to wait for the right, right time we, we could say vidura had been advising dhritarashtra for so long none of that worked uh, in fact i have a whole class on vidura and dhritarashtra the di- dynamics of their relationship so many times vidura advised him dhritarashtra mostly neglected him sometimes even rejected him at one time dhritarashtra ex- banished vidura vidura went to the forest to join with the pandavas and then dhritarashtra had a change of heart he felt remorseful and he called vidura back and vidura came back that's why vidura was enormously patient and it was not just the strong words of vidura that cut dhritarashtra's illusion dhritarashtra had come to a point where he was ready for surgery it was not just dhritarashtra vidura surgery that worked it was dhritarashtra's readiness for surgery what was that readiness for surgery vidura Uh, sorry dhritarashtra as long as he was attached to the duryodhana 
that blinded him but when he lost that attachment so oh, when duryodhana was killed after that he became ready for enlightenment so it was so the words have to be spoken at the right time to have the effect otherwise they will not have the desired effect they can have a counterproductive effect so vidura never spoke so strongly before that it created a permanent break with me between his and the trash relationship in fact that is one reason also why vidura didn't go and fight on the side of the Kaur, of the pandavas if he had been a part of those who had killed dhritarashtra's sons that would have closed dhritarashtra's heart he would never have been able to hear from vidura so vidura took great care and had great patience before that operation or could say that operation that surgery was successful so now let's look at some points that yes i'm not saying here at all that we should never speak strongly but we can't speak we can't use strong speaking as a justification for not considering the consequences of our speaking so yes there are times when we need to speak strongly so let's consider a couple of situations one is when people have wrong conceptions and the other is when people are making wrong choices so uh, a part of education is correction okay this is how you think but this is how it is and a part of guidance again is correction you know, don't do this do it this way so there are times when the definitely correction is required broadly speaking when we function in the world we have certain ideas of how things are and we have certain ways of doing things and in both there can be mistakes so conceptions and actions or choices so there are times when people need to be corrected and sometimes Uh, a gentle word may not be enough so sometimes strong words are required however the point is not just to speak strongly but the point is to correct the conception or the point is to help the person choose properly and we have to see whether that is happening or not so some people may feel for us this is a simple choice what is the choice either i speak the actual truth or i speak the compromised truth no if you're not speaking this as it is then you are compromising well is that the actual choice the actual choice might be a little more subtle it might be what is the actual choice we do we speak in a way that attracts people to the truth or do we speak in a way that alienates people from the truth so some people see the choice simply in terms of the content of what what is being spoken but others see the choice in terms of the effect of what is spoken so yes they have wrong conception i'm going to correct it but do they after your speaking do they go away with a corrected conception or do they simply go away alienated from you you're making a wrong choice i'm going to blast your choice but do people feel inspired to choose right or do they feel pressure to choose your way our way till we are no longer there to pressure them and then they will go and choose whatever they want so or sometimes they may not choose our way also so the, the when we the actual choice is not just what is the content but also we have to infer or at least be aware of what is likely to be the, what is like what is the probable effect and based on that we choose so even when people are making wrong choices which are which to us are clearly wrong now again when i talk about wrong conceptions and wrong choices see all this i am presuming that we we are right and others are wrong or we are like surgeons and others are uh, that we are pre- competent surgeons now there is no i mean they could have a whole class on how this presumption itself may be wrong now what we consider as wrong conceptions might not be wrong conceptions it might just be our incomplete understanding of what the situation is what we may think as wrong choices may not be wrong choices they may be they may might be wrong for us but they might not be wrong for the other person so we don't know that but here we are not going into all those subtleties we are making certain presumptions that even if we are right and even if others are wrong even if we are authorized still we have to be careful what to speak of in the other cases when we are not authorized or when we are not sh- when we are can't be sure that our conceptions or our recommendations are right so even when people are so i'm taking one such case like that So when people are making a clearly wrong choice, then what do we do? 
you know, we stop the person from doing wrong. And then in stopping them doing that from doing wrong, they feel so alienated that we end up ruining the relationship. Or we focus on maintaining the relationship and letting the other person err, and then they become wiser. So, for example, with respect to parenting, there are phases when when the when our children are small, then they we have significant level of authority over them, and we may tell this is wrong, this is right, and that's an essential part of parenting. But especially when children start becoming teenagers, they start becoming youth. So, if you start forcing them to do something, well, if you start force, we would like our children to say practice bhakti, and it's important that we do that, that they practice for us. So, I have a whole seminar on parenting separately. Uh, on my website but here suffice it to say that we may force them in their early childhood but we force them as adults if, we, if they don't want to practice we force them and this is they, they want to do certain things and we say no you should not do this well we may stop them sometimes but they will resent us and their memories of bhakti will all be unpleasant oh you know i was forced to do this i was forced to do that i was forced to do that and later on if their memories of krishna are, are unpleasant why will they continue the practice of bhakti so we may stop a person from doing wrong wrong means they just stop practicing bhakti uh, but we may force them to practice but we may ruin the relationship ruin their relationship with us ruin their relationship with krishna sometimes letting people go wrong and learn from that experience but we maintain the relationship that might be more productive sometimes if say we tell we tell someone you know you are wrong and you are not listening to me you are being stupid one day you will realize your stupidity and you will come crawling back to me now if we speak like that what is going to happen is even if they are wrong even if they realize they are wrong they will not come back because now it has not become an issue of the fact it is not an issue of the heart it has become an issue of the ego so sometimes preserving the relationship is more important so now somebody may say no but in our tradition there are so many references to people speaking strongly well yes they are there but there are many other references also so let's look at a few here so for example nectar of instruction the upadesh amrut says that the great devotees are anya nindadi shunya ipsita sangalabdha that the great devotees are free from the tendency to criticize others in fact bhakti siddhant thakur says don't criticize anyone whether devotees or non devotees they have their conceptions and move on criticizing criticizing correcting them is the spiritual master's business their spiritual master's business not your business so then if you consider the bhagavad gita itself there is already this was anudvega karam vakyam but a characteristic of the godly is apaishunam it is not just not fault finding but aversion to fault finding in fact if we look at ourselves sometimes we get delight in fault finding so somebody might make a somebody might make a very earnest spiritual inquiry or they might earnestly exp- express the spiritual aspirations and within that there is one point that is wrong we zero in on and speak that so we are like vultures looking for corpses so in fact krishna says harsh speech is a characteristic of the demoniac people not the div- divine people and then krishna also says in the bhagavad gita do not agitate the minds of people na buddhi bhedam janayet agyanam karma sanginam joshayet sarva karmani vidwan yukta samacharan so in fact he is saying even if you are enlightened and others are ignorant even if you are detached and others are attached still don't disturb people's minds and what should we do he says joshayet sarva karmani engage them in such a way that they can be gradually elevated so don't agitate so anudvega karam vakyam same point and how to deal with the differences of opinion we can disagree without being disagreeable and krishna in the gita he talks about yagya dana tap karma na tyajyam iti chapare so he talks about yagya dana tap the three activities and he is presenting two different schools of thought some people say that tyajyam doshva dityete karma prahur manishinah that is some people say that we should give all these up and others say that no this should not be given up so then he is saying those who think that they should be given up they are called as manishinaha now manishinaha is a very respectful address mana is the mind isha is the controller so krishna is saying they are they have controlled their minds so basically why is krishna appreciating them 
Actually, Krishna afterward refuted that position. Those who say that karma should be renounced, they are wrong. No, karma has to be done. Krishna says, but Krishna res- respects them because they are at least thinking about what will disentangle us from the world. And for that purpose of disentanglement, they are they are deliberating various choices. So look for the good in others, not the look where others are right and appreciate them more than look where others are wrong and catch them and get some savage delight in catching them. Now, we may look at, uh, so this is Shastra. And I just talked about an act of instruction and Bhagavad Gita itself. We can go into Bhagavatam, we can go into Chaitanya Charita Amrut and there are so many references for sensitive speaking. Now let's look at Shila Prabhupada's example itself. Now we could use many, many examples, but let's look at one word. Prabhupada sometimes would use the word fools and rascals. Now, where did Prabhupada use that word? Let's consider. So I did a whole study of Prabhupada's Veda base. Veda base is the, the compilation of all the works of Srila Prabhupada spoken and written, which have been transcribed and kept compiled. So Prabhupada uses the word 2000, this this. Rascals 2,791 times in his conversations. Mm-hmm. He uses it 1373 times in his lectures. He uses it 325 times in all that the Veda base calls as books. So now, all the, for example, we have books like Life Comes From Life. We have books like uh, Perfect Questions, Perfect Answers. These were not books. These were conversations which were made into books. Mm-hmm. Uh, later on, edited into books. And he speaks it only 157 times in those works that Prabhupada spoke or wrote for publication as books. And those are the list of the books are given over there, some of them. So now if you consider Prabhupada has spoken millions and millions of words and we consider how many times Prabhupada has used the word Krishna as contrasted with the word rascals. Krishna Prabhupada has used thousands and thousands and thousands of times literally. So, so Prabhupada did use strong words, but we'll see again the context. His conversations are where he uses it the most. And conversations were with an intimate group of disciples. So where we could say already the trust had been earned. People had already accepted him as that they were patients and he was the surgeon. They're ready to have that, that surgical scalpel acting on them. Mm-hmm. But Prabhupada, what he wrote for publication, there are 157, and it's only 157 times. And the books are also a massive compilation of work. So Prabhupada was very sparing, I could say, in the use of strong words in his written works. In fact, in 1976, one disciple wrote to Prabhupada and said that, Prabhupada, uh, I would like to transcribe all your lectures to understand your message better. And Prabhupada said, that will be prayas, that is unnecessary endeavor. I have given my message in my books, just read my books. So and, uh, there's explicit letter of Prabhupada like that. In spite of that, Prabhupada's lectures were transcribed. And yes, we can always, the transcription is not bad. Uh, it's good because we can get to know Prabhupada, how he spoke also. But the fact is, whether Prabhupada would have wanted his lectures and especially his conversations, to be in the public domain is open to question. You know, Prabhupada spoke it privately. What, spoke, what Prabhupada spoke privately, whether he would want it to have it in public domain is seriously open to question. And um, so sometimes we may say that Prabhupada spoke strongly. Yes, Prabhupada did not hesitate to speak strongly when necessary. But if you look at when he did it, it was mostly in situations where he was accepted as the surgeon. And if you look at times, there are, now I could go into a whole discussion on this, but the way Prabhupada conducted himself in India with life members, we know that Prabhupada spent almost last six, seven years of his life from 70 onward, most of the time he spent in India. And most of the time he spent with life members who were, with, of course, I mean, those who were not already committed to him, most of that time he spent with life members. And most of these life members were pious people who already had some spiritual connections. They might be, have been initiated by this Mayavadi guru. They might be affiliated with that organization. 
and when prabhupad would meet with them talk with them go to their homes they would take him to their altar there is i asked giriraj maharaj this question giriraj maharaj just completed a book on uh, on how prabhupad built the juhu temple so he said that he doesn't remember ever prabhupad going to anybody's home and commenting critically of what is present on their altar never so we can get a very lopsided understanding of how prabhupad was by saying that oh, prabhupad spoke strongly well yes my understanding is prabhupad spoke effectively and that effective speech was sometimes strong and sometimes gentle there is a okay, there is a uh, in the lila amrut there is a story of one disciple okay one of the early disciples he came to uh, came to india with prabhupad and i think he came with kirtanananand who who kirtan who later became swami and he started growing his beard again he started wearing western uh, kind of clothes and he started looking like a hippie and he not only was growing his beard he was growing his hair and he was disheveled and he was going with everywhere with prabhupad everywhere for his programs and what did prabhupad do prabhupad told told his disciples you know please tell him to shave his head to to appear like a respectable person but he didn't listen and then one day uh, the new back to god it magazine had come and in the in the back to god it magazine and there was the story of haridas thakur uh, who had to, who had converted the prostitute and delivered her so early so there was a picture of that prostitute who was looking very alluring before and then she was sitting and chanting and she was wearing a, a dress of a serious spiritualist wearing a sari properly clothed and her and she had even shaved off her hair so so prabhupad asked called his disciple and he asked him you know what do you see the dif- can you see what do you see the difference between these two pictures so she is a devotee yes. yes what more do you see what what does it mean he says she is chanting yes what else oh she has shaved her head yes prabhupad said so then this devotee asked prabhupad do you want me to shave my head yes prabhupad said so his own disciple prabhupad is so careful why because prabhupad was seeing that he was not really very committed and if prabhupad if he spoke strongly now and when i'm saying why i don't know what why, why prabhupad did what he did but from the context we can presume that prabhupad could see that he was not very committed and if prabhupad spoke strongly he might go away so with his own disciple prabhupad was so sensitive so what to speak of others so we cannot we don't deny that prabhupad spoke strongly but to think that speaking strongly is the only way to be faithful to prabhupad is to misunderstand and misrepresent prabhupad to to be faithful to prabhupad means to speak effectively to fulfill the purpose of shri prabhupad according to our capacity that means that say if we are part of medical staff we may have seen our surgeon do surgery use the scalpel so to be faithful to the surgeon doesn't mean we pick up scalpel and we use the scalpel to be faithful to the purpose of surgeon means we treat the patient we treat the patient according to our position and according to our capacity so there's a there's more much more we could speak on this topic of prabhupad's mood and prabhupad's usage but we are running out of time just i'll make two points now so generally what all do we need to correct someone so we need a relationship with them we need the right situation where they are in a receptive mood then um, so situation is more in terms of the circumstances that they are going through in their life or circumstances we are in we suppose we correct somebody in public they may feel so humiliated that they may not accept it at all then they, we need to have the right disposition to we need to have the right disposition and they need to have the right disposition to receive and of course we need the right information sometimes we think that my information is correct your information is wrong my logic is correct your logic is wrong and therefore i'll correct you well that is very superficial understanding and we will not be able to benefit people so this last part i'll conclude humility in speaking what does it mean we should know that our words won't have effect unless desti- unless it's accompanied by destiny or krishna's will and therefore we need to pray before we speak krishna when we say before class when we pray it's not just a ritual 
it's actually krishna speak through our heart and krishna within the audience's heart open their heart so that they can understand what we are saying so what does prabhupad say in markine bhagavat dharma he that is such a, uh, if you really want to understand what is prabhupad's mood instead of looking at his uh, occasional usage of the word rascals look at the mood in markine bhagavat dharma prabhupad is so so dedicated in his mission but so humble in his petition he says krishna you make my words understandable to them alankruta koribara khamata tomar now when he's talking about this what is he referring to he's not just simply referring to his heavily bengali accented english which people might not be able to understand he is wanting to connect with their hearts and that prayer was spectacularly successful and that's how people was able to trans prabhupada was able to transform so many hearts and inspire so many people so if we ra- rather than thinking that i have to speak strongly we have to, we can focus that i have to be humble and to know that when am i actually acting as krishna's agent and when am i acting as my ego's agent i am right and you are wrong speak to give people a piece of our mind that means you know you are such a fool and i am going to show you how you are a fool or speak to give people peace of mind the ultimate peace of mind comes when people connect with krishna and we speak in a way that inspires people not just instructs people but inspires people to connect with krishna so for our speech to be effective the biggest quality that we need is virtue that's why kirtaniya sada hari we are able to do can constantly glorify krishna when there is trunadapi sunichena tarorapi sahishna before that when there is humility and tolerance so in this context humility in presenting our world view our our understanding and tolerance of people's wrong conceptions or tolerance of people's wrong choices till we are in a position to correct it to help the not just correct it but to correct it in a way that they can they take the correction positively so with this humility we can actually speak purposefully and effectively so i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke on the topic of how we can be um, how we can speak in a way that gives people peace of mind and not a piece of our mind so first point is power of speech constructive is people can be encouraged people on the verge of suicide can be people contemplating suicide can be saved destructive means we can shatter people's hearts we can uh, demoralize and devastate people and for a world conqueror more important than sword expertise is word expertise chan kya says and then words shape worlds then for tapping the power of speech we have talked about based on the bhagavad gita's four attributes the sensitive and sensible and we talked about the uh, that how a doctor uh, if is too sensitive without being sensible it's like treating a refusing to give injection because it will hurt the child and being sensible without being sensitive is like doing surgery without giving anesthesia so truth without compassion is hard hearted compassion without truth is empty headed we discuss the four quadrants and if we are excessively politically correct then we are we are compromising the truth uh, or we are just political posturing about being moral or being good on the other hand if we are excessively logically correct then we may instruct but we may not inspire people people need to sh- sense how much we care for them before they care how much we know so then of course if uh, there is neither truth nor compassion then we are gossiping which is destructive so uh we need to scum- speak in a way that we care for people's present feelings and we also care for their future future trajectory in life so then why often we may be we may feel justified to speak strongly and we may end up abusing that power why because our scriptures tell us that sadhus words cut people's illusions and we may think we are also going to cut people's illusions but the example of say sadhus words being like surgeons we discuss there's consent the required pre medical pre surgical or non surgical treatments have to be tried out and anesthesia has to be given and also a pain medication has to be given so in the context of our communicating with others the consent is that you know 
people should accept that they are that they they are wrong they need correction and that we are authorized to correct them so prabhupad had that with his disciples in the private conversations we can't presume that we have that second is why would um uh, second uh, second is that we non surgical intervention means we i talked about the four a's we appreciate their uh, spirit of their spirit of wanting to know and like that various things we we appreciate the acknowledge the correct point correctness in their point even if it is tiny like that we try to build bridges then with respect to anesthesia means words we need a warm relationship to soften strong words and pain medication means that we we may go away but there have to be others who can offer uh, deals them tender loving care tender love and care so that the strong words impact can be mitigated negative impact can be mitigated and then we discussed say vidura was successful with dhritarashtra but that was not just because he spoke strong words but because he waited for the right time to speak the strong words and he built a relationship with incredible patience till then so to decontextualize the whole relationship and just focus on strong words is to misunderstand the past time and then they discussed about how the gita has many references to speaking strong uh, to sensitive speaking and prabhupada was also very cautious in how he spoke especially when he was speaking to a larger audience the his uses of strong words in private conversations is high but rascals is very sparing in his written words in his words which he spoke for as books so to be faithful to prabhupada doesn't mean that we speak strongly but we speak effectively and that means that we don't use a scalpel just because of our, because our head surgeon uses a scalpel we treat the patient appropriately according to our capacity and lastly i concluded by talking about the need for humility in our speaking it's not just our strong words that are going to change people's hearts it is krishna acting in our hearts and krishna acting in their hearts that will lead to them opening their minds and ha- minds opening their eyes and opening their hearts not shutting their mouths and shutting uh, shutting their minds so thank you very much hare krishna हरे कृष्णा प्रभु जी हरे कृष्णा प्रभु जी दंडा प्रणाम सर थैंक यू सो मच प्रभु जी वेरी वेरी वंडरफुल क्लास टुडे सो जस्ट रियलाइज वी आर ऑलरेडी ऑन द 50 45th uh right out of the 51 verses so i just wanted to request you prabhu ji if you can consider uh, uh, that you know we progress towards shrimad bhagavatam in such a thematic way so that uh, we also understand bhagavatam prabhu ji so it's just a suggestion for your perusal thank you prabhu ji hari krishna thank you thank you for the suggestion i'll keep it in mind we are discussing what to do after the complete the, the gita we'll discuss that thank you for the input now yes now there's a question from partha sarthi prabhu that um, how prabhupada spoke strongly against mayavadis and he was strict to the regulations on observing fasting and we should follow uh, similarly in his food step is that considered to be harsh speech in such a scenario and if he speak flowery words to attract people to the truth is there not a possibility of diluting the principles yes now there are two three different things over here first is prabhupad spoke strongly yes but there are times when prabhupad spoke otherwise also there are there when prabhupad when prabhupad was sick at that time when the early the 1966 or something mayavadi came to meet him uh when the mayavadi came to meet him so at that time prabhupada uh, uh, and his disciples were sitting around him prabhupada told his disciples get up and let him sit prabhupada was on his bed even because he was sick and prabhupada spoke very cordially with him then there was prabhupada was with uh, prabhupada used to live with the mishra yoga studio live at mishra yoga studio with with this dr mishra who was a yoga teacher and who was a who was a mayavadi and prabhupad met him after many years and giriraj maharaj told me this past time and giriraj maharaj also written it in his books that uh, he prabhupad was very warm and cordial with him 
and later on prabhupada told him that you know philosophically we are at loggerheads but culturally we are friends so sometimes we reduce people to philosophical categories so no we have to consider prabhupada's culture we have to see cultural perspective of shila prabhupada and from the cultural perspective of shila prabhupada we understand that prabhupada did various things at different times and what he did was appropriate in that context so yes prabhupada spoke strongly but the problem is we take prabhupada speaking strongly as the standard but on what basis are we deciding that prabhupada is speaking strongly as the standard because he spoke in different ways at different times uh, he spoke in different ways at different times and there's a desh kal patra that prabhupada considered and we also have to consider so now is it harsh or strong speaking well rather than judging whether it's harsh speaking or strong speaking see what is effective and now we may not know what is going to be effective but we can based on our experience we can infer um, as far as i have seen in my experience i haven't seen strong speaking being effective at all if people have despite strong speaking continued that's because of their sincerity it was not because of the strong speaking but in spite of the strong speaking that they they continued one of my close friends um, he this is one of you wanted to look at this slide so you can have a look so one of my close friends even i was in college he was like a social activist in college timings and i was more like a intellectual person so i used to host programs in my hostel room and he would also come so uh, he came sometimes and he liked it and we invited him to the temple and he came to the temple and somehow it was a festival and i probably made a mistake in inviting him at the time of festival but the festival that reason why he came to the temple also so but somehow he couldn't meet me because the small temple very crowded he met somebody else and that person spoke to him that that he was talking about various spiritual teachers and there's a very popular spiritual teacher in india considered very charismatic and this devotee told spoke very strongly against that spiritual teacher and he said that spiritual teacher was such a demon that he wouldn't find space even in hell now how do we know who has gone where and first of all it's so presumptuous to think that we know the destination of people uh, that but secondly it was such a horrible thing to speak and i not only this did this boy stop coming for the program but he said this is what these people believe and next few weeks hardly anyone came for our programs and now this boy was activist he was spiritually inclined now he has become a mayawadi mayawadi sanyasi in that very organization which was condemned and he is a international preacher so what what did we gain by speaking the truth nothing at all only we damage things so sometimes the example is given that we should speak it is better to have like there's other part of it are we not diluting the principles if we are speaking flowery words so the example sometimes is given that prabhupad said that it's better to have one moon than a thousand stars yes that's true but you know in our our preaching is not so much to find the one moon our preaching is often focused on criticizing the thousand stars not even criticizing we are actively trying to extinguish the thousand stars why do that the vedic culture is multi level people who can't practice pure bhakti they are allowed to practice worship of the devtas not only allowed they are facilitated the scriptures only give means for them to practice impersonalism is also a respected spiritual path shaunak rushi so not shaunak rushi shamik rushi is an impersonalist and parikshit maharaj is respectful to him parikshit maharaj doesn't go and say you are a rascal the bhagavatam doesn't criticize shamik rushi at all we might say he is a brahmavadi not a mayavadi however the categorization of brahmavadi and mayavadi is not found in scripture itself so it's a presumption for us to say who is what it is a categorization that the gaudi acharyas have done to distinguish between the different forms of mayavad it's a valid categorization but the point is that how do we know when somebody is impersonalist are they 
they might be following a mayavadi teacher but they might not have mayavad they might not even understand what is mayavad they might just be following that teacher because they are they are attracted by that person's charisma or their social service or their nationalistic appeal or whatever so yes, uh, we are we speaking flowery words well i would say it, it depends first of all when you use the word flowery word there is a value judgment over there itself so uh, i would say that we need to speak in a way that helps people come toward krishna so rather than like we discussed earlier about one zero kind of digital spirituality if you so it's like you are a you are a moon come inside if you are not you are a star i will extinguish you you know we crush and kill people spirituality sometimes so we people people say god is impersonal we say god is personal and we have a big argument and at the end of it we may think i proved that god is personal but other person thinks this whole god business is very confusing this whole god business is very confusing so better that i don't get involved in this business at all i just stay materialistic or atheistic so we have extinguished the star over there so in seeking the moon so what is the effect of what we are doing no so if we look at say websites like uh, kora or other where thoughtful people come and ask questions but many times wherever iskon comes up many people say iskon is so fanatical iskon people are so judgmental so why is that you know we can say are all those people uh, foolish are all they demoniac no they have had negative experiences so i would say that you know we would have had at least 10 times more people uh, connected with our movement if we had not been so judgmental and so dismissive so we, we it's like we are sometimes it is said that we are sometimes it is uh, like hitting the axe on one's own head on, on one's own foot you no know, like like cutting one's own foot one's own, with one's own axe but instead of, we are not just doing that we are actually placing axes everywhere on our path and proudly jumping on those axes and wounding ourselves and thinking say i am tolerating so much pain i am so strong so i would say in the present moment we are our biggest enemy it is our preaching that is destroying our preaching not destroying but damaging so when i travel across the world somehow we all attract different kinds of people so i meet the victims of so called strong preaching and i try to salvage their spiritual lives as much as it's possible and i have met so many people like that so yes are we diluting well again word the diluting itself is a judgment so how do we decide was prabhupa diluting when he accepted life members if you if you see please read prabhupa's conversation with life members is prabhupa insisting you have to dress in a particular way you have to chant 16 rounds prabhupa is having reasonable discussions with them prabhupa speaks philosophy sometimes strongly but if you look at the wide spectrum of conversations prabhupa has with them he, that what is recorded is that prabhupa speaks strongly with them but before that prabhupa would welcome them prabhupa would give them nice prasad prabhupa would ask about their families prabhupa would prabhupa would broadly be a cultured sadhu with them so unfortunately what we have is only what prabhupa spoke but how prabhupa conducted himself that we don't have record so prabhupa did not insist for the life members now we say they are life members they are not devotees well how are we going to define devotees then everybody is volunteer in our movement during prabhupa's times most of our movement in the west was insiders or temple residents most of the movement was uh, india was life members now if we consider the present movement is neither life members nor insiders most of it is congregation devotees so where do we place them they are all all volunteers so if we speak strongly as i said spirituality is an option for them and within the option of spirituality they have so many other options so people will go away there are i don't want to criticize gaudiya math but most of the gaudiya math is populated because of people being disgruntled with iskon now they are disgruntled with iskon for many reasons but one of them is just unnecessarily strong speaking presuming that i am right and i have the right to correct you so 
yes there is the ever present danger of diluting but i feel that that is a far lesser danger in our movement right now than the danger of strong speaking mm. does it address the question so we'll take this one thank you now is there i don't see any evidence from Mm-hmm. where did with where does it say that sanjay fought the war sanjay did not sanjay was sitting by um dhritarashtra side and explaining what happened over there yeah he reported from he reported by sitting next to him so i'm not sure what is the question here um prabhu sanjay was fighting the the ten days to when bisma put in ash and then he just uh, then bandha wanted to kill then he just came from then basde actually uh, stop not to kill like that some an explanation in mahabharata well was sanjay fighting a war before and basde told yeah, him he, he fight fighted for 10 10 ten, ten days uh, bandha wa- wanted to kill them then uh, like that well i haven't heard anything like that there is some amount of uh, we could say confusion and I, i i got some clarity but i won't say this is conclusive i'll give you my current understanding so it is true that the whole kurukshetra war is not narrated live so for the first 10 days sanjay is in kurukshetra hmm. and then he comes back from kurukshetra to hastinapur and then he tells dhritarashtra that bhishma has fallen and on hearing that he so sh- shocked sorry uh, dhritarashtra sh- shocked that dhritarashtra faints how can this happen please tell me everything and then he starts narrating from the first day onwards so that's one aspect of the story now the other aspect is that sanjay was given mystic powers by which he could see the kurukshetra battlefield from where he was in hastinapur so actually vyasadev uh, meets dhritarashtra before and vyasadev is in one sense related to dhritarashtra that dhritarashtra pandu and uh, vidura they are all born from the semen of vyasadev technically i mean biologically speaking or genetic whatever you want to say you can call him his father but because it was the niyoga so that ritual you know the when that ritual is done then it's not that he's not considered to be the father is considered to be the child is considered to belong to that family so so but still they had a close relationship and vyasadev came to advise dhritarashtra many times and finally when the war became inevitable dhritarashtra vidra told sorry vyasadev told dhritarashtra that i can give you vision to see the kurukshetra war if you want he said no dhritarashtra knew in his heart or at least that was his great fear that his sons may die and therefore he felt that maybe i should not uh, he said i i couldn't see my sons alive i don't want to see them dying so he refused and he said give sanjay the vision and he gave sanjay the so dhritarashtra and on the trash of the quest we asked dev gave sanjay the vision and that's how sanjay was able to see the kurukshetra war, war from where he was so now as far as sanjay fighting in the war is concerned i haven't i haven't seen that as being uh, mentioned anywhere he was there was he one among the warriors maybe maybe not sanjay is technically a suta like karna was also suta so they they can fight but more often they are charioteers and uh, charioteers narrators like that various things so it's unlikely that he would have fought but yeah that is it is there that uh, the mahabharata is narrated after 10 days so the understanding is that sanjay had that vision and sanjay also went to the kurukshetra battlefield and he came back after 10 days and the 10 days he narrated what he had happened as he had seen it and after that he narrates based on his mystical vision but even those 10 days narration if we read in the mahabharat it is given from the perspective of the omniscient narrator 
Now, if you read novels, there are different modes of narration. So, omniscient narration means what? That say, if sometimes the whole novel is told from one character's perspective, then that character doesn't know what is happening in other characters' lives unless somebody tells him that character. Or what omniscient narrator means? Say that there is a hero and a heroine. Then sometimes the screen, sometimes the author is this novelist is describing what is happening to the hero, and then other times is describing what is happening to the heroine. And when the two meet, the reader knows what has happened to both of them, but the but the hero doesn't know what has happened to the heroine. The heroine doesn't know what has happened to the hero. So then sometimes there are misunderstandings because of that. So so that is that is the narration in the omniscient narrator mode. not a first first person or second person or third person perspective but omniscient narrator perspective so the mahabharat war is narrated before, for the first 10 days as well as the remaining 8 days in the omniscient narrator mode what that means is that even if sanjay was there at a particular place in the kurukshetra war he wouldn't have known everything that was happening everywhere now what was happening in the kaura camp now the vivid details even if they have spies how much vivid details can they know so so that benediction is seen in action for all 18 days irrespective of whether sanjay was in kurukshetra or was in hastinapur he is able to narrate the mahabharat war using that benediction itself so that's how we can reconcile the fact that he had a benediction and also he had different locations okay so we'll stop here uh, prabhu yeah So uh, just one clarity that then when exactly the Drast or Sanjay got I mean say the Vidushti from Vasudev is it before war or after ten days? Uh... Well, that happened at the start. That's what I understand. So the Mahabharata has different recensions, and sometimes there is some confusion about exact chronology of events. this is what i have been able to uh, crystallize till now okay so thank you very much uh, krishna vidyanath prabhu for your comment happy to be of service yes i feel that prabhupad is immensely compassionate and our understanding of prabhupad is also like very finite so sometimes we need to nuance our understanding i need to we all need to so somehow uh, in the first generation many devotees came from uh, a particular religious background where this is the only way was what taught to them and they often took in prabhupad in that way and they started presenting this is the only way and it was not only prabhupad is the only way but their understanding of prabhupad is the only way that's how it came about so i feel that as we are also evolving in our uh, spiritual lives our understanding becomes broader deeper so thank you very much for your participation there is a, oh there is a question by param karuna prabhu okay okay so showing people the reality of material life is that harsh speech well no i won't call that say harsh speech is where we speak facts even if they without considering the feelings of people now after considering sometimes we may decide that yeah i have to i may have to hurt their feelings so broadly speaking if we can speak facts without making it personal without making it personal means say if somebody says i am an atheist instead of telling them that you know i am going to refute all your arguments today what are your arguments instead of putting it that we just rephrase it don't make it personal this is you know okay when you meet with your atheistic friends what kind of arguments do they have let us see if we can refute them make that person your partner hmm? don't make that person your antagonist and especially people may have but they may have some respect or veneration for certain spiritual teachers so you can we can we can counter their philosophy but don't criticize those people that so don't make it personal personal means don't make it between you and them and don't make it personal saying don't criticize particular spiritual teachers we can criticize ideas that is not a problem so the idea that material life is 
is um, they think I'm happy in my material life. Well, uh, okay, as you rightly said, how long? We don't have to. We don't have to go and say, okay, you are happy right now, but you will become a worm in the stool in your next life. We don't have to say that, but we can yourself point out the unpredictability of life. We can give examples from contemporary life of somebody who is a millionaire, and that person might have become a pauper in this life itself. You know, I believe that a, a, one of the previous U.S. presidents, you know, he had Alzheimer's, and for the last several years, in this very life, he didn't even remember that he was the president. So, you know, okay, we may be happy right now. but a sign of human intelligence is to look at the future and to prepare for the future so yes i am not at all saying that we shouldn't speak the philosophy but it's just that we make sure we at least are aware of the emotional impact of our speech and then sometimes we may decide the emotional impact which is painful it is essential and it is acceptable for me Uh, it is essential for my context sometimes you may decide okay instead of giving this example can i give this example and it may not hurt people so much so uh if say <clears throat> if you want to talk about how modern society is breaking down now we can give various examples we can give example of suicide we can give up example of uh of so many things but if in our audience we know somebody has attempted suicide and they are survivors now then should we speak that example at that time so we may have nothing against them but if you are aware should we speak that so try to avoid making it personal and that's why it's important for us not just to speak to people but to hear from people to understand where they are coming from to understand what their situation is what their contexts are so then we will understand which are going to be like uh, their blind spots which are going to be their sore spots and then we can moderate our speech appro appropriately at one time i was very sick for almost one and a half years i was sick again and again and again and nobody was able to diagnose what was wrong so i had so many uh, injections given without injections given basically insertions in my body to take blood out of my body so i was admitted in the hospital so one time the nurse came and she wanted to put a needle and like there were needle pricks on my entire arm not just one arm but both arms because so many times blood sample had been taken so then that that uh, nurse could have said you know okay that's your problem i am going to insert the needle but actually she spent about 3 4 minutes trying to locate where there was no needle pay, there was no needle prick before and she inserted it there now i appreciated that that okay you may say needle prick is not a big pain but still it's a pain and if some somewhere it's already been pricked then why prick again so all that i am saying i'm not saying at all don't speak strongly i'm saying let's just be aware that strong speaking alone is not following shila prabhupad effective speaking is following shila prabhupad and a part of effective speaking is strong speaking so certainly we can speak strongly at times but for our strong speak to be effective strong speech to be effective we need to be aware of the context and that means we be aware of the emotional consequence emotional impact of what we are going to speak and sometimes that emotional impact is essential sometimes it is non essential if it is non essential then change the examples change the context i said don't make it personal or make change the examples if you want to give example of attachments then in india i might give example of how people are attached to say pets but in the west i may not give that example now in, in india also don't give that example so much why because you know we could say attachment to pets is bad but what is the cultural context of people you now say if people is a people don't be attached to dog or you'll become a dog in next life well okay uh, instead of loving god people are loving dog well okay but for most people loving god is not in their horizon at all right now their alternative to having a pet is binging on netflix watching movies their alternative to having a pet is living alone feeling depressed and sorry for themselves their alternative to having a pet is maybe just uh, consuming porn and uh, wasting time on social media so among the options that they have maybe having a pet is is the best among the options that they have so we have to be aware in fact one of the ways another say you could say 
non non intrusive non chemical ways non chemically intrusive ways that means not taking chemicals without taking chemicals if people are to be cured of depression having a pet helps because people get out of their own minds and they care for someone else now i'm not recommending a pet over here i'm simply saying that the examples that we may give we may have used in a particular context now even 30 years ago society was not as fragmented the family units was not as disintegrated people were not as lonely as they are now so in today's context when the same example which might be perfectly valid earlier might might be extremely counterproductive so just be aware of the emotional dimensions of what we are speaking that is the point i am making not that we should not make philosophical points not that we should not make strong philosophical points also but just be aware of the emotional dimensions of what we are speaking okay so thank you param karna prabhu for that important question and thank you everyone for your participation shrimad bhagavad gita ki jai shri prabhu pad ki jai gaur bhakt vrind ki jai 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 gaur premanand